of the South will rise at the judgment with men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden, or under a bowl. Instead, put it on the stand, so that those who come in may see the light. See the light. Your eyes is the lamp of your life. When your eyes are good, your whole body also is full of light. But when they are bad, your body also is full of darkness. See to it, then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light, and no part of it dark, it will be completely lighted. <coughs> as when the light of the lamp shines on you. Okay. Marley, you were worried about that being too long. You nailed it. Let's start with prayer. Father, we do thank you so much for your word. As we dig into your word today, Lord, help open our eyes and open our minds. Help us to not ride the fence as Jesus is trying to teach those that are coming after him, longing for what he has to offer. For what he has to offer is the fact that he has saved us for all eternity. He wants to be the Lord that he deserves to be. We just thank you and praise you for serving your son. We thank you for your mercy and grace. Pour out your spirit upon us today as we study your word. In the name of Jesus we pray. Children's Church? Yeah. And I forgot to mention during announcements, I want to talk to everybody who wants to come to a mini board meeting and remind me so I don't forget right up here afterwards to talk about a phone. Okay? I'll tell you more about that in a minute. That includes Jacob's phone number two. Don't let me forget to tell him that. It is so, the true light. Who is the true light? Jesus, right? So if he's the true light, as this passage is saying here, maybe you caught it, maybe you didn't. If you can't see that clearly, then you have an eye problem, right? Whether it's a moat sticking out of it or what it is. It's not a problem with Jesus. It's a problem with our vision. And on the front of the bulletin I put, one that I saw, you can't really see it, but it says Jesus, the true light, you can't see that true very well, a conflict. Because see, here's the problem. We fight a spiritual battle. Is Jesus going to be Lord of your life or is Satan? Jesus says it over and over and over again. You can't fight. You can't ride the fence. You can't serve two masters. You can't follow after Him and say, Lord, Lord, and not follow His commandments. He's clear. So sometimes that adds a little conflict. But the light is fine. There's nothing wrong with the light. And the light has come into the world to expose the darkness. What kind of light bulbs do you have in your home? See, we don't like to change, do we? We like to ride on our own things, our own might, to read Scripture right, Merle, and to do other things rather than letting God lead us through it. So how many of you still have incandescent light bulbs in your home? Hmm, they stink. They're terrible light bulbs in comparisons. They're wasting energy. They heat up your house in the summertime that you don't need. If you didn't know it, there's fluorescent light bulbs that are better, and there are LED light bulbs that are still even better, right? But a lot of us haven't changed because we refuse to see the good light. Okay? So I hope you can get that and figure it out. Because that's a good analogy for our spiritual life. Whether we try all of our might, all the time saying, I hope I'm good enough to get into heaven. I'm going to try to kick this habit that I know that's a sin and it's wrong. Rather than saying, Jesus, the true light, come and take this away from me. I give it to you at the foot of the cross. Because you defeated all of that. You gave me power to live a life empowered by the Spirit. Please help me to do that, Lord. As I said, an incandescent light bulb contains a glass enclosure containing a tungsten filament. An electric current passes through the filament, heating it to a temperature that light is then produced. The problems are is you have an excessive amount of heat, 
You go buy your light bulb based off the wattage you want to see clearly. Now, if you're growing up in my house, we had the three-way light bulbs. Okay? You left them on the 15-watt setting all the time so they wouldn't burn energy and produce heat. But what happened? You couldn't read anything. You walked around and stumbled in your house because it was half light, right? Instead of us walking around in the full light of Christ, we stumble around sometimes because we put him on that 15-watt setting, right? Rather than turning it up. Guess what 15 watts of an LED bulb will do? It's bright. It doesn't have the heat. There are so much differences in those LED bulbs. How they work is they bring together currents with a positive and negative charge to create energy. Spirit is energy, isn't it? We're filled to the brim with it. We've just got to tap into that energy source. And then light is released from it, from that energy. Isn't that exactly what will happen in our spiritual lives again? If we tap into the energy of the Spirit, we will shine like Jesus. Our light will shine so that others will see it. Not long ago, though, bulbs were simply bulbs, were they? And that's the same thing that's going on here in Luke 11. There had been previous um, Old Testament saints that came and everything and prophets, and you know, most of the time people didn't want to believe them. They wanted to rely on their own keeping of the law or whatever the thing was that they relied on for their, for their strength, for their salvation. But Jesus says, I am the light. You can't ride the fence. You can't do it on your own. You can only do it through me. If you're not seeing clearly, the problem is not with the light. The problem is with the, your sight, with your eyes. They wanted to see Jesus as someone who would come to take care of their problems. What they did not want to see is Jesus as Lord, who He deserves to be. <clears throat> The crowds were growing. We read that in Luke 11. Jesus performed more and more miracles. Every time He did, He had more and more crowds that followed Him. It was a sight to behold. Surely this man was from God. But most people weren't willing to pay the price. The disciples didn't even understand it truly. And there were people in the crowd who opposed Jesus. There were people in the crowd who hated Jesus. So let's go back a few verses in Luke 11. In verse 14... Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. They seen this wonderful light, something like they had never seen before. But were they willing to change the light bulbs of their heart? Some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Really? How many signs do you have to see before you're willing to believe, right? How blind are you? The crowd saw this new LED Jesus. It was brighter than anything they'd ever seen before. They didn't understand or comprehend it. They knew He had to be from God. But because of their wickedness, that's what Jesus says here. They could not see the light. What a wicked generation. Paul explains it a little bit this way in Romans chapter 1. Verse 18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. We can't do it on our own. We are wicked people, whether we want to, to say that or not. The world tells you that we're good and we're getting better all the time. But the Bible tells us that man is inherently evil and his heart is desperately wicked. These people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Verse 19, Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. All you've got to do is look outside, look at life. You can see that the fingerprints of God, as Jesus said earlier in Luke 11, you can see that there is a Creator, that there's design. And then the fact that the Creator would choose to love you the way He does, adore you, your beloved in His sight, where He would give His Son up to save you from your sins. Wow, how lucky we are that we have such a God. <clears throat> Verse 20 says, from, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, His divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made from His creation. But we tend to worship created things rather than the Creator. So that people are without excuse. You cannot come judgment day and say, but I did not understand this or that. And Jesus is clear in His teaching. Verse 21, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. We maybe had a 40-watt light bulb, we turned it back down to a 15 and stumbled even more, right? 
because we tried to do it on our own rather than to see the true light. Isaiah chapter 5, 20 and 21 reads, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. And I know I've been guilty of that. If you don't going to say you are, then you're lying again. <laughs> I have plenty of times thought that what I was doing was right and godly and everything when my motivation was the exact opposite of that. I thought what I was doing was wise in my own eyes, but it was foolish in God's eyes. And His Word was clear right in front of my face. And I've done that more than one time. I've done it plenty of times in my life. The crowds increased... As Jesus performed more and more and more miraculous signs by the finger and power of God. But in verse 16 it says, Others tested Him by asking for a sign from heaven. And that's what we're going to look at that today because Jesus addressed that the others. He's already addressed those who said that He was casting out demons by the power of Satan Himself. How many signs does this wicked generation need? <clears throat> It's like this. I knew a man once that I witnessed to, and he always said to me, if you can prove that God exists, then I'll believe. So one day it just kind of hit me, and I said, you know, I've got proof, because I want to see what he'd said. You know, proof is in our own mind how we perceive things, again, because of our own sight that leads to our own heart decision. Because we believe with our heart and profess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. I said, I've got proof. Are you ready to accept it? He said, sure, I'm ready to accept it. I said, well, here's the thing that comes along with it. When you see this and accept this, that I've got this proof that God exists because you can't see it from everything that you look at, then you need to make God and Jesus Lord of your life. Now are you willing to do this? No, nope, the answer changes then, doesn't it? Because see, then I have to change. I can't just accept Jesus for my Savior that I can go to when I want to go to Him and put the coin in the vending machine and get out the results that I want. I can't understand why there's pain and suffering in this world because I chose to sin. Because we live in a fallen creation, but God loves us enough that He would send His Son to make everything right, to save me from that penalty and power of sin. The problem is with me. I don't want to give up my self-centeredness. I want to, don't want to take myself off the altar so that I can place God on the altar. And that's what the people were facing in that day, and that's what we still face today. Verse 29 started out, as the crowds increased. So there are more and more people coming to see this new LED Jesus. And Jesus replied, I'm glad you came to see me, right? I'll do some more miracles and do a song and dance for you so you'll believe, right? No, that's not what He said. He said, this is a wicked generation. Wow. It asks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. Second example, the Queen of the South will rise at judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. You can't ride the fence. If you ride the fence, you're going to be condemned at judgment day. You're going to think everything in your heart you were doing were right, but by your own foolishness, you're not going to be able to see the true light. Jesus was teaching about prayer. He was teaching His disciples. He cast out a demon. He addressed those who said, by the power of Satan, you're casting out a demon. And He backed them in a corner, if you remember, and said, if I am casting out demons by the power of Satan himself, who are your people casting them out? So there's nothing they could really say. And now he comes up with, you know the Old Testament, you know these signs, you know these stories, and by your own laws that you try to keep for works of righteousness, I'm going to condemn you. Not because I don't like you, not because I don't love you, because I'm going to lay down my life for you, but because I want you to see the blindness that you have because you're refusing to see the true light that's here. If you look in your bulletins, I put several little sayings in there that caught my eye. It says a relationship with God that doesn't change your life isn't really a relationship with God. Think about that one. Another one says your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief of God. 
Because if they see their light in you, they should wonder and wonder why you follow after this Jesus. What, what can we do to find out about this? And then this one says, What a shame it would be to almost live a Christian life and then almost get into heaven. Because if you ask these people, did they think that they were doing things right? Did they think that they would inherit eternal life? Their answer would have been yes, because they were relying on their own power and their own might. But Jesus calls them a wicked generation because they don't want to see the true light. They want what God can offer them, but not the fact that God is Lord. They didn't want the obligation that it takes as being... In the youth, that was the biggest thing that I faced. I faced so many kids that came to me and said, I understand what you're saying, I believe what you're saying, but I'm not ready for it yet. The reason they weren't ready for it yet is it meant they'd have to change the lifestyle that they had now. Because if you believe this way, you can't keep on living that way. It will affect you. So Jesus is saying, if you truly believe, you will make me Lord. You will cry out, Lord, Lord, and you will obey my commandments. You will follow after me. So has Jesus truly changed your life? Have you repented? The people of Nineveh did. The most wicked city of all the time. This is where Nimrod was, was famous. We talked about that a little bit Friday night, about the giants that were in the, the land at that time and things, and the wickedness of this world. And they built a tower trying to reach heaven so that they could escape a flood if a flood came again or so that they could maybe even get to heaven by their own might. It was a wicked, wicked generation. And Jonah went and the whole place repented. Everybody. It doesn't say that one person did not. <clears throat> so if you believe, have you repented? Do you truly believe? Has it changed your way of thinking and therefore changed your life? A Christian life should not even resemble remotely the life that the person had when they were a non-Christian. If it's not showing, then we need to show it. Because we are the light of the world now, because Jesus has left and left us behind as His ambassadors, as the light of the world, as the salt to the world. Because of God's undescribable love, His unfathomable mercy, His unending overflowing grace, he gave His Son to die in our place. We're approaching Easter coming up. Be thinking about that. Be thinking about the fact that God Himself came to earth and took on the sins of all mankind on His shoulders so that we could be saved. I can't comprehend it. But that's what my God did for me. That's how much He loves me and not me because who I am, I'm the wicked generation. Not because you're any better or anything else, but because He loves all, because it's who His nature is. Because He is love, mercy, and grace. If we realize that, how could we ever live as an enemy of the cross after we've understood the power of the cross? So Jesus reminds him of the prophet Jonah. And He's not referring to the amount of time He's going to spend in the tomb or anything else in this example. Because verse 30 says, For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. There's what we're looking at. The comparison is the herald that Jonah was. Jonah was sent to be a messenger to the Ninevites to say that impending judgment was coming. And they chose to repent because they believed that God is God, that He sits on His throne, not we sit on our throne, and they repented, and it led to salvation. Looking at Jonah, Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. I think our wickedness is made known. I think our wickedness is still here. Nothing has changed in the wickedness of this world, except that we have an answer now, Jesus Christ, if we'll choose to see that light. Going on to Jonah chapter 3, starting in verse 3. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. It took him a while to get there. We know that. And went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 
Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. If you look at his message, there's not much to his message. So we don't have to think we have to be all prepared and have everything down. We just need to be doing the Lord's will. Saying that God loves you. That He wants to save you. And that may be all you need to do. You don't have to be well versed in the scriptures or go to seminary or anything else. Look at me. There's proof of that. You just have to be obedient. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Verse 5. The Ninevites believed God. Wow. A warning reached the king of, oh, excuse me, a fast was proclaimed. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne also, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. If you don't understand what this means, it's an it's a image of repentance, of sorrow, of remorse, for realizing what you did, that you changed your way of thinking, that you asked God for forgiveness because He is the one that is sovereign, not you that you repent of your sins against God. Verse 7, This is a proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people, or animals even, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Totally change lives. Verse 9, Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn His fierce anger so that we will not perish. Because we do serve a loving God. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, He relented and did not bring on them the destruction He had threatened. The King James Version there says repented. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that God changes His mind? Does that mean that God's sorrowful for it? Genesis 6.6 6 uses the same word. It says, The Lord regretted that He had made human beings on the earth, and His heart was deeply troubled. Did God make a mistake creating us? See, my God makes no mistakes. He's perfect in every way. I read His Word. I understand that. Not all of it by any means. And I understand that He created a perfect, holy creation. But He gave us free will. And we decided to sin. And when He repented, it means that He was sorrowful. I brought sorrow, a tear to God's eyes, because I sinned against Him. The one that He created, the one that He bought back with the blood of His own Son, His child repented against Him and brought sorrow to Him. So the Lord in Nineveh was sorrowed by their actions. And He said, I'm going to show them compassion. I'm going to show them mercy. I'm going to show them grace. What a perfect sign of what Jesus was going to do. What other sign did they need? But Jesus goes on to talk about the Queen of Sheba. He continues to give them signs. We have to repent to accept the offer of salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. He says here that He's the only sign that is given because He's the only thing that's needed. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So many times I hear today, what is the Lord waiting for? Is He still there? Does He hear my cries? That's the same thing that the Israelites were saying back then. Yes, He does. And the reason that He is not come yet is because He still longs for people to come to Him especially those that are already His children who are disobeying, and especially those that don't know that we need to be the light to them. God loves every single person, but there is coming a day of judgment. Peter continues on writing in verse 10 of 2 Peter 3, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. There's urgency. We don't know when that day will come. Thank goodness that it hasn't come yet if we haven't done our part in telling others about Jesus Christ. If we haven't been the light that we need to be. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. But this, for this wicked generation that Jesus was talking to at this time, and for this wicked generation now, let's look at the second thing that Jesus said. In Luke 11 verse 31... 
The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. The queen of Sheba, in all of her glory and all of her might, found out that there was this king named Solomon whose wealth and wisdom preceded anything they'd ever heard of before. What do you think is going on in Jesus' day? Here's this prophet. Some say he's the son of God. We've never seen miracles like this. Who raises people from the dead? And yet we want to tell him to give us another sign. She traveled to the ends of the earth to find out what was going on with Solomon. In 1 Kings 10, verse 1, When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test, to try and prove, to see if Solomon's, this was true about Solomon. And if it was true, then it was true about his God because she knew that's where the, the power and the wisdom came from. So she came to Solomon to test him with hard questions and riddles even. She came to test and try. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with testing if God is sincere because He is. But when you get the answer, when you see the light, realize that you see the light and it's not a problem with the light, but it's the problem with your vision, with your eye. Instead of keep on demanding for a sign because your heart is still evil and you don't want to believe because you don't want to make Him Lord of your life. Here's what she discovered, reading on in verse 2. Arriving at Jerusalem with a great caravan, with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain. Why? Because God gave him that wisdom, right? We know that already. 1 Kings 4.29 and 30 says, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sands on the seashore. No wonder he could answer her questions because his questions came from God, the answers did. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east and greater than the wisdom of Egypt, the greatest place of all. So she heard about this. In verse 4, when the queen of Sheba saw the light the light that was reflecting through Solomon because he relied on the true light of God. She saw it with her own eyes, all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace that he had built, verse 5, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers, his, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord. She was overwhelmed. It's what the people should have been in that day when they saw the miracles of Jesus. Instead, they were stubborn and hard-hearted and continued to ask for a sign. She yielded up her spirit is what that means. She gave her spirit up to God's. In verse 6, she said to the king, The report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told to me in wisdom and wealth. You have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your people must be. Are we happy? Come on, we know about Jesus. Are we happy and we know it? Okay. <laughs> how happy your people must be how happy your officials how content, who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom praise be to the Lord your God who, is delight, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel because the Lord's eternal love for Israel he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness and she gave the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices and precious stones. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. She gave so much back because of what God had given her. He had made her see the true light. So what are we giving back in our lives when God gave His Son for us? Hiram ships brought gold from Ophir, and from there they brought great cargoes of almond wood and precious stones. The king used the almond wood to, write, to make supports for the temple of the Lord and for the royal palace and to make harps and lyres for the musician. Remember when we talked about joy at Christmas and breaking out in song and dance? That's what they're going to do here. So much almond wood has never been imported or since that day. King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all she desired and asked for besides what he had given her out of his royal bounty. Then she left and returned with her advisors to her own country. Now verse 13, King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all she desired and asked for. How much if you ask for will the father not give you his spirit? Hmm, right? 
And if she went back to her own country, back to our world where we're aliens and foreigners here, but we are ambassadors, what should we be, be, we be doing? I guarantee you she went back and was quiet and sat there and didn't tell anybody about what she found, right? She told everybody about what she had found. That the God of the Israelites was the true God. A queen from a pagan land with her own eyes, because her eyes weren't diseased, or whatever the problem is, saw the light and responded to it. And she will stand up at the day of judgment and condemn those who do not repent after the sign of Jesus Christ. And so will the Ninevites. Luke eleven thirty two says, The men of Nineveh will stand up at judgment with this generation and condemn it. So not only her, but the people of Nineveh, of Nineveh will come because they repented. So they're going to be in heaven now. They're going to be with God eternal. These wicked, wicked people that just simply got in 40 days judgments coming. And they responded. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater, much, much greater than Jonah has come standing before you. And you ask him for more of a sign. <clears throat> there is a saying, some people will change when they see the light. Others change only because they feel the heat. And see, Jesus came so we wouldn't have to feel the heat. He is the light of the world to save us from an eternal, literal hell. In Luke 11, it continues on, No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. I guarantee you the Queen of Sheba did not do that. I guarantee you the Ninevites did not do that. They saw the light and they put it out for the world to see. Jesus is the light of the world. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. The King James Version says the light of the body is the eye. There's not a problem with the lamp. The bulb is good. There's a problem with your eye. If your body is not full of light, then you have an eye problem. Reading on, when your eyes are healthy, single, steadfast, fixed on the light, there's no cloudy vision, no unhealthy eye. Your whole body then is also full of light. But when, they're, when they are unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. So Jesus is reinforcing what He just said. There's no problem with the light. The light has come before men to expose darkness. The problem is whether you're going to accept it or not. If you're going to let your heart be softened up. If you're going to see clearly. So verse 35, See to it then that the light within you is not darkness, that you're not fooling yourself, saying, I have light already, I don't need Jesus. I'm okay. I, I'm not a bad person. You need Jesus. He's the true light of the world. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light, and no part of it dark, you're not riding the fence, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines its light on you. You will reflect Jesus' light to the world. Here's the question Jesus is asking you today. He is the true light. He is shining on you. You've heard His message. You've heard these words just like the people of that day did. Are you going to be a wicked generation? Or are you going to listen to His calling? If your eye needs fixing, He can fix it. He's willing and able. There's nothing that you can do, nothing that you ever did. The Ninevites should be the perfect example. There's nothing you can do that will keep you from God's love. He loves you oh so much. Even if you are His own child in rebellion, He simply says, come to me and I'll fix your sight so that you can reflect me. Matthew 18, 9 says, if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Whatever it's going to cost you to get rid of that out of your life, get rid of it. Whatever the cost you think it might be. Because it's better for you to enter into eternal life with God than it is to be thrown into the powers and fire of hell. John 8, 12 says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows Me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of light. Tolstoy said this, Everybody thinks of changing humanity, but no one thinks of changing himself. Steve Lawson says, if Jesus had not changed your, has not changed your life, the Jesus you met was another Jesus. Billy Graham says, by faith I accepted Him for what He claimed to be, the Son of the living God. That simple decision changed my life. 
I have seen it change the lives of countless others across the world. It changed the lives of the Ninevites, all of them. It changed the life of Queen, the Queen of Sheba and whoever she represented that light to. We don't know the rest of that story, but I guarantee you there's a story there. You must believe that Jesus is who He says He is, that He did what He said He did. <clears throat> and you must follow after Him. Repent, change your ways. Follow after Him and be the light of the world if you're going to be His true followers. Are you willing to do that? It takes making Him Lord of your life, not just Savior. Will, let, will you let Him heal your vision? Father, we do thank you so much for Jesus' words, for His actions. Lord, that you would send Him to minister here on earth to teach us. That He would live a life that we could be, follow after. That He would teach us the things that, he's, that He taught us, Father. And that we know that we don't have to rely on our own power and might. Because He gave us Your Spirit to guide us along the way. Father help, us, Father, help us to look at the examples of the disciples even who, tr who walked with Jesus for three years and then still Peter denied Him on the day of His death. But once they came to grasp of what really happened and the Spirit came upon them, they gave their lives totally and the church grew immensely. We pray that growth for our city for our state, for our country, and for the world. That we may bring those last ones that are supposed to come to you so that Jesus may return and that we may spend eternity with Him. We thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you that Jesus was obedient even to the death of the cross. And we just pray for the strength that, that we need that will be empowered by your Spirit. May we give our hearts and lives to Jesus and follow after Him as Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is God.